Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with the great jazz drummer Bernie Drussell. He just released 2017's Livin' and Burnin', and he's quite an educated cat. He has a BM in performance and music education from the Eastman School of Music. He is the drum chair for the Grammy-nominated Gordon Goodwin Big Fat Band and the Grammy award-winning Brian Sutzer Orchestra. These days, he's busy in L.A. as a session musician, and he's done TV scores on shows like Knott's Landing, Dallas, Suddenly Susan, Jag, and Star Trek's Next Generation. I know you probably heard him. He's a funny and intelligent cat with so much to say, so get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. Bernie, thank you for taking a minute out for me today. I appreciate it. Sure. Let's go ahead and start off with the, uh, with the new album, 2017's Living and Burning. Talk to me about this album. What, how do you feel about it now that it's out and it's in the, uh, in the hands of admirers? It's a constant struggle to get people to know the real name of the band and the album. <laughs> I'm halfway teasing, actually. But the name of the album is not Living and Burning. The name of the album is Live and Burning. So, and I decided to, uh, you know, have a little pun on my name, Bernie. So, Burning is spelled B E R. N I N apostrophe and and even to confuse matters more the the live and the and part is a, a letter n with an apostrophe so it makes it a little hard to find so i i have to really make clear on people the the real title of the album live and burning and even the band name the the name of the band is called the BBB featuring Bernie Dressel and it's, it's interesting because uh, in the old days, I'm, uh, you know, I'm 55 now, uh, every band had the word the before it. <laughs> it was so common, whether it was the Beatles, the Monkees, even like the Miles Davis Quintet. But now a lot of bands don't have uh, the word the in front of it. Like I, ha- I played for 15 years, I played in the Brian Sensor Orchestra, but I also played with... Gordon Goodwin's Big Fat Band, which is a big band. And there's no the in front of that. So anyway, I tried to get the the real name of the band out there, too. Most big bands, which a big band is four trumpets, four trombones, five saxes. That's a general size of 13 horns for a big band. And then your rhythm section. In this case, upright bass, guitar, and drums. There's no piano. But about... 95%, 98% 95%, 98% of the big bands all time always had the word big band in it. So I tried to be different here. I don't even have the word big band in it because maybe at some point I'll, I'll make it even larger and, you know, because I'm thinking on the next album of, of adding the Los, uh, Los Angeles clarinet choir to the band for some of the tunes. So I want to kind of keep that option open. So the name of the band is the BBB featuring Bernie Dressel, which is me, and Dressel is one S. And Dressel, to uh, further confuse it, most people think two S's. Okay, so having a big band, oh, my gosh, you know, it's such a, uh, a rush to play with that many people on stage. There are 16 of us, and it also creates uh, – Issues of keeping a band together that size, as far as calling them for gigs and uh, if a trumpet player can't make it and goes down the line, you know, for gigs, just keeping the band afloat. But, you know, I, I've been a side man my whole life with different bands, and I do a lot of studio work uh, for uh, TV shows like The Simpsons, Family Guy, Nerf and Dad, and uh, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, all kinds of different shows. And movies, I recently have done Star Wars, uh, Rogue One, uh, Jurassic World, Zootopia, uh, War for the Planet of the Apes, and Spider-Man Homecoming. But there's a lot lot of that kind of studio work that I do, and I'm fortunate to do. But it's so great to have uh, control of the music that I can play stuff that uh, I want to play and that would might feature me, um, uh, rather than being a sideman. So having your own band and having this size band and... You know, I grew up on the Buddy Rich Orchestra and the Beatles, and uh, so big band and rock and funk and all kinds of stuff that uh, having a, a big band of my own, per se, is uh, quite fun and quite uh, quite an adventure. And so after this first album, you know, like we're just submitting it for a Grammy right now, uh, 
So uh, there's things to do and uh, all the time as far as keeping the band going and moving it forward. Let me ask you this. Let me get back to the beginning of your life. Obviously, everything's worked out quite well for you. How did everything start for you? Where were you born and raised, and what was your childhood like to get into music? Yes, I was born and raised in Sharon, Pennsylvania. So a small town on the Ohio border near Youngstown, Ohio, kind of halfway between Erie and PA and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, but when you're from Sharon, you say, you say you're from Sharon, PA. You don't say Sharon, Pennsylvania. You say Sharon, PA. So that's where I grew up and a really great place to grow up. Uh, a lot of music happening there locally as far, uh, not like a big city, but for a small city, there was a lot going on with my high school and, and uh, around town and things to do there. But I, you know, I grew up hitting pots and pans at my grandmother's house with wooden spoons, things like that. And I'm talking about when I'm, you know, like three years old. I know, like two years old, it's it's kind of a familiar story for some musicians, uh, especially my age or a little bit older, uh, that they heard the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, and that was in uh, February of 1964. So I'm two years old then. So. You think, oh, he's two years old, but it made a big impression on me looking at all, all these all the people having fun, jumping around, people liking the music, obviously the band sounding great, energy. And it actually comes, you know, historically three months after John F. Kennedy was shot. Hmm. And uh, I remember that. And one of those things, why I remember that, I mean, I'm literally exactly two years old when he gets shot, is television. I remember our black and white television, and I still ingrained in my memory seeing him on television speaking and my parents being sad. And that hit me, and I was confused because they were, you know, they were trying to explain that he was dead to a two-year-old or not around anymore, and I didn't get that because there he is on the television. But what it was was a film clip of him speaking, you know. And so that probably intense sorrow followed by the, you know, three months later, the Beatles, it's a pretty big uh, emotional moment happening there and with television and ingrained in your mind. And so my dad tried to, you know, bring me for lessons because we'd be taking Sunday drives in our 59 Cadillac and I'd be in the back seat. And again, I'm talking about two years old and I'd be banging on the back of the seat with my hands as we listened to the radio on the Sunday drives when we didn't care about gasoline. And that was fun to go in the car and drive places, especially in a 59 Cadillac convertible. So, uh, you know, they see me banging on the seat, and they, you know, wow, he's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> so they tried to get me, my dad took me into Mark's Music in Feral PA, which is now in Hermitage, PA. They're still there. Wonderful music store for for lessons, and they said, oh, he's too young. You know, two and a half years old, too young. Okay, bring him back later. So three and a half, oh, too young. Four, uh, you know, finally at four and a half, they go, okay, we'll give them a trial lesson. So I was very quiet and listened very well, meaning I wasn't uh, hyperactive, jumping around, attention span issues. I was very focused little boy, I guess, uh, that I could, and maybe it's just more that I was shy and didn't say much. So I uh, listened very well. And uh, the lesson went very well at four and a half years old. And they said, kiddingly said, yeah, you should have brought him in earlier. Um, But so that's when I started drum lessons where my parents were told by the music uh, teacher, Bob Bedell, to, okay, well, take that drum set away. I mean, the vintage drum set my dad had bought for me back then, that was the bass drum, you know, I'm four and a half, that bass drum probably seemed so huge. Uh, I don't even know how I reached up. I probably sat pretty low and reached up to the other drums that hit the bass drum at that age. But uh, they said, well, take that drum set away because now we're just going to focus on hands and a pad. And So that Christmas, Santa brought me a snare drum 
because the drum set was gone, sadly gone, but knew this was part of the uh, process. And for three years, I just practiced hand stuff, not on a full drum set. So um, that went on through uh, until uh, I was about eight years old, and Santa brought that drum kit back for me. 1968 premiere, yeah, Blue Swirl. And uh, so that's when I... Uh, that's how I kind of started, and I did drum corps stuff as a youngster. Drum corps, not like we have it today. What we had in the small town there was drum and baton corps. So they were kind of like drum line stuff, but with baton twirlers. And it wasn't drum and bugle, at least where I was there. So I did a lot of stuff with that as far as parades and competitions. And actually, from 10 years old to about 13... We would go to South Bend, Indiana, to Notre Dame University every summer and do some competitions. And I was national snare drum champion for my age group during that time as a kid. So that's the kind, you know, kind of upbringing. And then, you know, doing some bands and with musicians that are always older than me, uh, playing some pro gigs when I'm 15 with the accordion player. Accordion was big in, in polkas in Pennsylvania when I was growing up. But then I played in a uh, kind of a funk rock band, too, called uh, Starbreaker. You know, we were just a bunch of kids, high school kids, and we had a three-piece band. We expanded to eight with horns and played around at dances. And then I went to the Eastman School of Music for college in Rochester, New York, got a music ed degree, got a performance degree in orchestral percussion, which is still helping me to this day to work the sessions that I do, because a lot of sessions I do are orchestral percussion and drum set. So uh, and then moved out to California, where I live today, in Los Angeles, when I'm 21, after college. <laughs> nice. That's, that, you, you, you went through a lot of years right there. So let me ask you this. Over the years, <laughs> you've been quite prolific in studios and, and jamming with people, not only in jazz, but all over the map. I mean, you got Brian Wilson, Ringo Starr, Maynard Ferguson. It goes on and on. Did you get any advice from anybody that you remember to this day that was very key from any of these folks? Yeah, taking advice all the time, you know, as far as, you know, the thing with, you know, as I'm in high school and seeing a successful band director and how great the uh, a music program it was at a high school and junior high level, and the parent thing of, well, you should get a teaching degree, something to fall back on. That's a common parent story for their kids, especially as musicians, uh, that if you don't make it as a player, which is a hard road, that you could teach, you know. And I like teaching. I was teaching private lessons to when I was 13 years old to uh, – uh, kids younger than me, making a little extra money, you know, instead of working at McDonald's, I was giving some private lessons. So I enjoyed teaching, except one time I tried to teach uh, my younger brother. <laughs> <laughs> and I was 12 and he was six. And uh, he's actually the drummer on the Jimmy Kimmel show. Not because of my teaching, however. <laughs> he, uh, uh, you know, 12 years old, you, you, you know, you don't have a lot of teaching skills, but you certainly don't know how to deal with teaching your little brother. So, you know, if I said, don't do that, you know, there was a little bit of extra brotherly nudging there that uh, that lasted about a half a lesson. And he said, I'm not doing this. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, teaching was a thing to quote unquote fall back on. And, you know, I still teach private lessons. I teach at uh uh, even though I live in Los Angeles, I fly to Las Vegas uh, about every other week during the school year to teach at UNLV, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, private lessons. Uh, well, advice was the actual question. I go off on tangents. Yeah, so, okay. And I even remember in college, you know, uh, even talking to a fellow student of mine, uh, my uh, one of my roommates, Mike Davis, who has played trombone in New York for many years, played with the Rolling Stones trombone. Uh, we talked about where are we going to go after college? New York, Dallas, uh, Nashville, Los Angeles. So um, I knew one um, bass player that had moved to L.A., and I thought, okay, that'll be good. And I like pop music, too, and jazz. 
Uh, rather than go to New York, I felt it was a safer environment. I thought L.A., even though I'd never been there, um, uh, and more of what I wanted to do and movie scores, et cetera. Um, going to a concert in Rochester during college, I saw Steps Ahead, and Peter Erskine was playing drums, and I you know, had the nerve to go up to him and talk to him on a break, and it was like a club atmosphere uh, where he was playing, and so I talked to him and talked to him about L.A., which is where he lived, and he said, yes, uh, come on out to, you know, L.A. Uh, there's, a, there's a need for drum set players that also play uh, percussion, you know, in the studios. And I was, because I was kind of asking him about it. It wasn't like some big invitation. He just thought, yeah, this, this, you could probably do well in L.A. And uh, so I did. So I guess that's some advice things there uh, along the way, whether from parents to uh, players to other students. So let me ask you this about your career up to this point. How mm -hmm. do you feel? How do you feel things have worked out? How do you feel about your career? Well, number one, I do, and you have to feel fortunate that you're working as a musician. Oh my gosh, what a uh, uh, great thing to be able to, you know, play an instrument, make music, and get paid for it. Um, now, sometimes it's very functional. That, uh, but it's always you're playing the instrument that you love, and it's what you want to do. And you, you know, I, you know, what else was I going to do? I thought about being an astronaut, but the moon program ended. Yeah. I, uh, you know, I thought about being a priest for a second. Okay, no, I'm not going to do that. That's too one dimensional. Uh, I probably wouldn't be able to play the drums as much. So, you know, there's, and I love math. You know, that's a, I think that's a big thing for musicians, maybe drummers, possibly uh, math kind of going with uh, uh, music. But, uh, you know, it's interesting. i got to bring up, too, that, you know, in the subjects in school, whether it's the essentials of math or English or whatever, social studies, you know, music programs that try to, I mean, school systems, school programs that try to cut music as a non-essential the arts is just killing our society if we it's a you need to have you know culture and arts in your life as as a youngster and as you grow up and before you die it's part of being human and life not just all these quote unquote essential subjects that music and art is so important to our culture if we don't have that if we don't have our culture we don't have anything and uh, a lot of school systems know that, and parents and and uh, administrators, but sometimes they look for ways to cut uh, programs and monies aren't there, and they they make the mistake of cutting that. And, uh, you know, I, I see a, a society that thinks of musicians as a singer on uh, American Idol or beatboxers. And they, you know, I asked a young kid, hey, do you play an instrument? He said, yes, I sing and I beatbox. You know, he, the real answer would have been, yeah, yeah, my voice is my instrument or whatever. But, you know, an instrument usually you tend to think of it being, uh, you know, uh, something you hold in your hand too besides your voice. But still, he didn't even think like, well, that was an option. He didn't know that was an option because it's not presented in a school. It's a private school you went to. Anyway, here I go off on tangents again. <laughs> what was the yeah. question? No, no, you, you <laughs> nailed it. I just I wanted to, I wanted to know about your career and what I want to do is segue into why do you love jazz? What I love about jazz is in some types of rock too, whether it was Hendrix or the Who, uh but jazz, Miles Davis, you know, big band, whether it's Thad Jones, Mel Lewis. I love the expressiveness in music and not just a loop of a beat over and over again, uh, which is a lot of pop music. Uh, well, there's not even a real drummer on the track. And I love human music, and that's what generally jazz is. There's rarely jazz unless it's smooth jazz. Smooth jazz, a lot of drum machines, you know, loops and drum machines, not real drummers. Not not all the time, but they do it to uh, for... Uh, so they can produce the record in their in their bedroom or whatever, and it's very stagnant to me. So I like non-stagnant music where there's drama, 
And what I mean by drama, you don't know if it's going to be good or not uh, eight bars later or what's going to happen differently eight bars later. When music rep is repetitive and repeats itself over and over again, uh, even though, like, the Beatles had, you know, a chorus, verse, and a chorus, verse, and a chorus, or whatever it would be, the second chorus would be different than the first, meaning just little, subtle, human inconsistencies that are exciting, that are different, and that's a very big element in jazz, maybe even more, even more so. And so I like human performance. And jazz is also expressive from a point of um, composing on the spot through composed on their on their solos. And a lot of times this can lose people sometimes as far as a listener that's not familiar with jazz, when they hear someone soloing, they they possibly might think it sounds like the Charlie Brown, the Peanuts teacher. Wah, 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 wah. Like they don't okay. understand what that person is saying. They don't understand that. So it's a, it's a it's education. That's where that comes in the schools. It's also about, you know, listening to things that are not the Gettysburg Address at first, but see Dick Run. You know where you see you get a little bit so that the listener can become educated as they listen to it more and more. In fact, with my big band, the BBB, featuring Bernie Dressel, on our album Live and Burning, we we I, I like to say we because I feel we're a band, but even though I'm the leader, um, but I have decided as a leader to hide the jazz a little bit not bombard, bombard people with the jazz, meaning the improv side of it, too much for too long. Um, and the typical Charlie Parker tune, for instance, or Dizzy Gillespie, you know, where you have 30 seconds of the melody, and then they go off and solo for eight minutes, and then come back with about 20 seconds of the melody, and the tune's over. In my big band, I try to have, like, uh, not long, long solos. So I try to, and that's really where people go, jazz, where there's improv. And uh, there's a lot of ensemble stuff, a la Count Basie, uh, that the tune will open up to or go to sax solis that are written out solis or melodies or sections or shout choruses that are not improvised. We might treat them differently night to night. I might, I would play something different behind it but the actual construction of the tune is a more, let's call it, accessible to the casual listener that may say they don't like jazz. Um, so um, this is why I like jazz. There's a lot of possibilities and human uh, decisions that are made differently night to night, song to song, and uh, different than playing a pop tune. So let me get to the crux of who you are. Everyone has a version of you, your family, your friends, everyone that listens to your music and buys tickets to see you. But at the end of the day, or the beginning of the day, I should say, who do you think you are? I'm Bernie Dressel. <laughs> I'm <laughs> unique. I'm unique. I'm a character. I'm a caricature of myself sometimes. I mean, I, I, I like humor. I like, uh, I like to... Uh, be honest and say what I really think. It's hard for me to hide my feelings. Musically, I play emotionally. I shape a tune. And that's how I am as a person, too. I'm emotional. I uh, say what I mean and try to say it clearly. And sometimes I don't pull any punches uh, to a fault. Not being rude. Not being mean. I'm definitely not mean. I, I'm, you know, if... Again, I go back to my Beatle upbringing. John Lennon might have been more, but where he's uh, more direct, could be cutting and even mean in what he says. Uh, Paul McCartney, oh, the perpetual smiling, uh, make everyone feel good around him guy. And I'm a little bit of both of that, but I definitely like to make people feel good around me. So, But I'm honest, too, so it's a kind of a juxtaposition to... Uh, um, have both and uh, where they kind of fight each other. 
but I'm bad at hiding my feelings. If I don't like a song I'm playing, it's hard for me to hide it. But as a studio musician, you know, we're seeing new music all the time. It's not something music you get ahead of time. You're sight reading, you're playing something for the first time. The creator that you're working for that's written the song or the music, he's never heard it before, and he's going to construct it and change it along the way. So as a studio musician, you have to be very giving and very uh, uh, supportive and to... uh, you know, they may ask for your what you think about it, and then you tell them, honestly, and without being mean if you don't like it. Uh, but try to make it better so it is a good thing. Um, so all those things play into my personality of who I am. And as a drummer, or no, as a musician, any any instrument, including vocal, I hate to put vocal down like I didn't mean to put it down earlier, not putting it down, Um just a physical instrument is what I was talking about earlier. When, uh, let's see, when uh, uh, our personalities come through our instrument. And when I teach, I teach usually drummers that they want to learn. They want to be there. And so they're very open to listening like I was as a young boy. But, again, I was shy as a young boy. And the more you play, especially the drums are a you need to be a strong leader and take the tune places. You know, a great drummer can make an average band sound great. A poor drummer can make a great band sound poor. And you have a lot of control as a drummer uh, of what happens. And uh, you need to be a strong leader. And so, if, like earlier as a youngster, I was, someone would say, how old are you? And I would whisper to my mom, I'm five. He's five. You know, and now I can stand up in front of a room full of people and tell them what I think and not be concerned that they agree or, uh, you know, or not be shy about it, I should say. So that's what happens. That's the way you have to play the drums. You have to be strong, a strong leader, no matter if you're Obama or George Bush, someone disagrees with you. You have to uh, still be, people still want a strong leader, not a weak leader. And that's what the drummer is almost like the conductor of the band. Uh, as far as making things happen, setting the tempo, a bed for everyone to play on top of. Um, and uh, personality-wise, you know, I tr- teach my students to play stronger. And then from what I tell them, you now be careful. This can change your personality, too. It goes hand in hand. Your personality on your instrument is your personality in real life, too, and vice versa. And they affect each other. So you have to be careful that you don't become... Uh, you know, a rude person in real life, because sometimes you have to be rude on the drums. So you have to be careful of that, that uh, you know, just you, your personality will change the stronger you get. And, you know, the older anybody gets, the more we really say what we don't care what people think. <laughs> yeah, if you're 70 years old, a 70-year-old will say things he didn't say at 30. I, mean, I don't care. This is what I say. That's right. It's true. <laughs> you totally know, there's true. not as much time left. And you go, I'm saying what I think, but you get tired of pulling your punches. So, right. yeah. That's perfect, man. That's perfect. I think that's a great way to sum you up and to sum up, you know, kind of your essence. Thank you, Bernie, for taking some time to talk to me about the new album, your life, and everything in between. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you for your time. I so appreciate it. Thank you. good questions, too. That was cool. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Kansas City, L.A., and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Bernie for his time, his humor, and his music. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.